Today, I'm going to conclude the series on the process of forgiveness. It's been a great series. Um, and I'm going to conclude today on a subject that's a bit challenging. But before I do that, why don't you take a moment and greet those all joining us online. We appreciate you being here. And I pray the word will bring transformation in our hearts and in our lives, specifically today, through our relationships. So I am going to talk about and conclude the process of forgiveness. In the process of forgiveness, there's a particular part, Pastor Dwayne, our senior pastor, the last couple sessions, has talked about reconciliation and what that is and what it's not and how to reconcile. And there's an important part of the reconciliation process that I see most of us aren't that good at and a lot of us are afraid of. Truthfully, we're kind of chickens about it. And that is confrontation. Very, very few of us like confrontation. Those of us that do, we have a label for you. Jerk. <laughs> okay, not, not really, but most, in most cases, yes, but not every time. Um, most of us, we don't like it. Uh, some of us are okay at it, and, but for the majority of us, we're just uncomfortable with confronting somebody, especially somebody we love, because we're afraid. We're a bit chicken about it. We're afraid that it might hurt the relationship even more. It might make things worse. And I imagine every single one of us has at least one story where we tried to confront somebody and it made it worse, right? Is that everybody? And, and when it made it worse, it just reinforced your commitment to avoid it at all cost, right? That, that's kind of how most of us have handled conflict. And so today I'm going to focus on giving you just some basic stuff. There's so much that could be said and how to do this in a skillful and loving way. I'm going to give you just enough to get the process started, and I'm not going to focus primarily on confronting something or someone that has caused an extreme amount of trauma in your life. If you've experienced something extremely traumatic, even this series has probably walked you through and maybe had it brought up some, some real uncomfortable feelings and maybe a part of your history that, that it's still a little hurtful for you. And so I'm, I'm not going to focus primarily on how to confront someone in that kind of extreme situation. I recommend you take what I say and maybe sit down with a pastor or a mature believer who knows how to handle those things. And I'm also not going to focus on the extremely petty. We just need to get over it. If we're super offended about the extremely petty, we need to get over it. But there's so many things that happen in our life, in day-to-day -day life, in our marriages, in our families, co-workers, um, clients. Uh, or, or maybe just friends. There's so many things that happen that we can't just ignore it. Something needs to be done because it's damaging. Whatever's happening is damaging the relationship. That's what I want to help you with, taking some of those simple things that you can do to be working towards reconciliation in those kinds of of relationships. Well, I want to start with the words of Jesus, because that's always the best place to start, right? In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17 in the Message Bible, Jesus says this, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him, work it out between the two of you. <laughs> it's a whole lot easier for someone to hurt you, and you go complain about it to somebody who is not that person, right? It's a whole lot easier to complain and criticize than it is to confront, right? And it's a whole lot easier to talk to people who have nothing to do with the problem. Why is it so easy to talk to them? But the person that actually caused a problem, it's really hard to talk to that person. Well, Jesus basically says, this is what you're going to do. If you're going to follow me and have relationships that are Christ-shaped, Christ himself says, you're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to work with that person. Not ignore it, not pretend it doesn't exist, not sweep it under the rug, but confront them. Actually deal with it with that person. And if he listens, you've made a friend. Your relationship gets stronger. Listen, you don't need to be afraid of conflict in your relationships. You need to be afraid of avoiding it. Because if you actually deal with real confrontation and conflict and work on it and work with one another, your relationship gets stronger. You've made a friend. But if you continue to ignore it and avoid it, it will only get worse. And so, but what happens if they don't listen? If he won't listen, our tendency is to go, well, I'm going to wipe my hands clean of that. I guess there's nothing else I can do. No, he says, if he won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. 
we usually chicken out at the first time. He's saying, no, there's even more past that. If they won't listen then, bring two or three witnesses. And if they won't listen after that, look what he says. Keep going. Next verse. If he won't listen, tell the church. Now, that doesn't mean bring a megaphone to the gathering of the church and tell everybody about it. Okay? It means go to mature wise elders or pastors that can help you navigate what that's looking like. And if he won't listen to the church, you're still not done. Man, how kind of hard work is this? What kind of expectation does Jesus have? High expectation, truthfully. You'll have to start from scratch. Confront him, but not that the problem they caused you. Confront them about something else, their need for repentance. And listen, Offer them God's forgiving love all over again. Do it again. Offer God's forgiving love again. So he's talking about four confrontations here. And again, we usually chicken out after, before the first one. So if we're going to have relationships that are Christ-shaped, Christ-centered, and we're going to reflect Jesus' heart in relationships, we're going to have to learn how to confront people when there's ought, when there's trouble, when there's, there's circumstances that's causing a relational disconnection. The way I want to kind of lay the groundwork for that is this. Rather than accepting or ignoring unhealthy behaviors or accepting relational disconnection, we need to be the kind of people who courageously and lovingly take a step toward confrontation. All relationships on their own will gravitate apart. It takes work to maintain a healthy relationship. Can I get an amen? amen? It takes work. Yeah? Left on its own, just like a garden left on its own is going to sprout all sorts of weeds and grass and it's going to get chaotic and messy. So relationships happen. Relationships don't stay strong and healthy on their own without work. It's kind of like the law of entropy. It's going to gravitate towards chaos is actually what's going to happen. So in every relationship, if we're going to maintain health, we have to do the hard work. We have to work on it. And when there's any kind of relational disconnection, when you know someone does something or says something that causes, even if it's just small, a little bit of disconnection, a little rift, a little separation, it's not extreme usually, just something small or subtle. When that happens and it's left undealt with, that rift, that separate, just gets bigger. And relationships, because there's two human beings in any relationship, those human beings are flawed, right? <laughs> Neither of us are perfect in that relationship. So they tend to gravitate outward. It's like, it's like we slowly and subtly start turning our back on one another. No one means to do that. No one's doing that maliciously or intentionally. It just happens. Well, it's important in those moments where we start to turn our back on one another, someone have the courage and the humility to turn around and take a step towards the other person. That takes courage and it takes humility because that turning is repentance. Even if you're not the one who's primarily at fault, it still takes some humility to turn around and take a step towards reconnection. So instead of ignoring unhealthy behaviors, because you know sometimes people have some unhealthy behaviors, and, and over, we can let them go usually, but then they just keep happening, and then they start to get under our skin. Yeah? And then you just let it brew until it grows, until this massive problem, and then one day, the final straw is dropped, and there's this huge rift. Let's learn before that problem it gets that bad to actually have courage and humility and lovingly take a step towards one another and maintain a healthy relationship instead of just tolerating unhealthy behaviors or tolerating disconnection. We can't do that if we're going to follow Jesus. Amen? Okay. So I'm going to talk about this in three different categories. The last one, pastor's already said a lot about, so I'll just wrap up with that on why this is so important to us. We need to start seeing what's at stake if we don't learn how to do this. And that's in reconciliation. But when it comes to confrontation, you don't just need to confront somebody. You need to prepare for it. Don't wing it. <laughs> All right? You've lost your winging it privileges, okay? If you're going to actually confront someone, prepare for that confrontation and do it the right way. I'm assuming you're going to pray about it. 
But on top of praying about it, I want to give you actual skills that you can, that you can have at hand to do something about it, and our, con- our confrontation ends up in reconciliation rather than our confrontation end up in a bigger mess. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, so number one, in preparation, number one, we are to value healthy relationships more than needing to feel comfortable. Nobody likes feeling uncomfortable. And most of us, unless you're joining us online from another country, we're Americans. We like to be comfortable. We pay a lot of money to stay comfortable. Nobody likes to be uncomfortable. And when you see that there's an issue between you and another person, even someone you deeply love, you realize, if I try to deal with this, it could get uncomfortable for me and for them. And I don't like being uncomfortable. So, so we just, it's not that big a deal. We sort of gloss over it. Or we just stop paying attention to that. Or, or, or the very spiritual one. Jesus, I pray you take care of that in them. I'll just let it be. Surely Jesus can solve this problem with that person. <laughs> yeah, possibly, but he's probably going to solve that problem in somebody else through you. Right? So we don't like to be uncomfortable. Well, listen, let me just say something hard but true. God doesn't care that much for you feeling comfortable. That might sound a little mean, but he's not. He's not super concerned about you staying comfortable. He sent a comforter. Why? Because in the process of doing what's right, in the process of following Jesus, there are going to be lots of times that you're going to be uncomfortable and you're going to need a comforter. When you are comfortable, you don't need a comforter. You're comfortable. Why would you need a comforter if you're comfortable? And so we try to live most of our life being comfortable. Listen, inside your comfort zone, you're not growing. You're not maturing. And so in the process of growing, you're going to get uncomfortable, and there's a promise. You have a comforter available for you whose presence is always with you. He will always be with you to bring comfort. Why? Because you will be uncomfortable. And when it comes to relationships, being healthy, you have to realize you fighting to stay comfortable is causing that relationship to be unhealthy. I'm not saying that you should always be uncomfortable. I'm saying that if you're going to fight for health and relational integrity, you have to learn to deal with hard stuff, and it's going to get uncomfortable. And what happens is we often are more concerned about staying comfortable than we are with the relationship. This was the, as someone who could have gotten a certificate in being a chicken when it comes to hard conversations, this was a major threshold I had to cross over. It happens in ministry that, you know, we have coworkers and we work together. We're fighting day and night for the people of God, for our church. And our vision here is to build healthy churches that are growing people in Christ, which means if we're going to have a healthy church, we've got to have healthy leadership. And healthy leadership have to have healthy relationships. And so when there are things that happen, and it, all, it happens all the time, where we start to see disconnection or someone is, is, is starting to commit unhealthy behaviors. It's not sin per se. It's just not healthy for relationships. I have to deal with that. I have to work with that person. I have to confront it. And I realized that I was excusing myself from those those conversations, hoping that Jesus would just take care of it. (laughs) But what I recognized in myself is that I was valuing a need to feel comfortable more than I was valuing our vision. I was more concerned with staying comfortable than concerned with keeping our vision intact. And as soon as I noticed that, as soon as I saw that, had that moment of self-awareness, I developed the courage and some skills that I'll show you. But I had to, I had to suck it up. I had to put on my big boy pants and deal with hard stuff because our vision was at stake. Now, it wasn't ex- at stake in the extreme, but if I don't learn to deal with the small stuff, eventually that small stuff gets bigger. And it's the same things happening in your relationships, in your marriages, with your children and your, and your co-workers' relationships. There's stuff that's happening, and we're usually valuing our need to feel comfortable more than we're valuing the relationship. And I'm telling you, Jesus does not have that same value. 
He values relationships far more than you staying comfortable. So he sent a comforter to help you with that. So you need to start checking your own values first. Do you value this relationship or do you value being comfortable? And that's number one. Number two, and this is really the first five messages on this series up to this point, but confront your own heart before you confront someone else's behavior. You gotta start working in self-evaluation. Have I forgiven this person or am I still angry? If I confront this person, am I just gonna pop off in anger? Do I just wanna tell them off or do I actually want reconciliation? Am I valuing winning more than I'm valuing the relationship? Do I value being one up or do I want reconciliation? And if you haven't confronted your own heart, when you go to confront someone else's behavior, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna blow up. I'm just telling you. If you want it to go well, you first have to confront your own heart. And listen, that is not an easy process. Self-awareness can be somewhat painful when you start becoming aware that, you know what? You're just ticked off. You haven't forgiven them. You're still mad. Yeah? And that if I try to confront this, guess what? You will get angry and it will come out. And if you're going to confront your own heart before you confront someone's behavior, then you're, you are much further in the process because you'll start working out the stuff that has to be worked out with Jesus in you before you worked out, work out what is between you and another person. So we need to confront our own heart before we start trying to confront someone else's behavior, which means we need to go into this confrontation as if someone else, the way we would want someone to confront us. And I'm going to tell you, there's different ways to factor in different personalities. I don't want to overcomplicate it. Let me say very simply how you would want to be confronted if you were the offender. You want to be confronted mercifully and with respect. So Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. In the Message Bible, you're probably familiar with other translations, judge not lest ye be judged. Like no one talks like that anymore, so we don't know what he means. This is what he means. Don't pick on people or jump on their failures or criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. So before you go into a confrontation, are you just jumping on people's faults? Are you just overly critical? That same critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. So if you're confronting your own heart, am I just being critical? Or do I actually want to help this person? Because if I'm just being critical, then guess what? People are going to be critical of you too. And I would really like to sow some really good seeds. Because there's going to be a time where someone's going to have to confront me and I would like mercy and respect. If I was really wrong and I really messed up, I don't want you to jump down my throat. I want to deal with the real issue and repent and us reconcile and get through it. And if you start jumping on me, then I'm probably going to jump right back. It takes a lot of maturity to be aware of that. And I can't promise that I'm that mature. So let's go into this the way we would want to be treated. Let's not be critical of people. And then number three, as you're preparing to confront somebody, distinguish the difference between facts and your feelings. Distinguish the difference between facts and the stories you tell yourself about the facts. This is so important. Okay, This is going to cause you to have to relive the moments where you got upset, which is why you first have to confront your own heart. And if you've forgiven the person and you really want to reconcile, then you can start reviewing what actually happened and try to determine what the facts are, not just your feelings. And I'm not saying that your feelings aren't important or shouldn't be in consideration. Just don't lead with them. All right? Don't let them control you. What are the actual facts? So here maybe is a common example in marriage, you know, if, if marriage conflict tends to brew too long, 
It could end in something to the effect of the husband would say, well, my wife just doesn't respect me. Possibly. So the immediate question, if you're, if you're talking to me, okay, how? Well, she just doesn't respect me. How does she not respect you? What does she say? What did she do? What did she not do? What actually happened? I hear what your story is, but what actually happened? Or a wife. My husband just doesn't love me. Okay, what is he not doing? And what does he do? So what happens is we take very common interactions, especially in marriage, day-to-day -day interactions and intersections, and, and we tell ourselves all sorts of stories about what's happening. And then we let it last so long that eventually we just assume we're right, that whatever we think is true. It may be, but it may not be. There's a chance. I know it's small. There's a chance you might be wrong. So again, we're talking about confrontation, not necessarily the process of forgiveness. I'm assuming that you actually can walk through the process of forgiving. But if you're going to actually confront this, assuming you've forgiven the person, then the next thing is, what happened? And if I can get to that, if I can get to that with you, you know, the husband may say something to the effect of, well, when, when we're with other people, she's just critical, okay? She's just critical, that's still a story, and that's your feeling about it. What does she say? Well, she's constantly getting on to me, okay, constantly getting on. I get it. What does she say? Because if we're going to resolve this, we need to get to the, bo the very bottom of it, and that is the actual words coming out of her mouth. And now we can deal, now, now we can say, now here's how I feel about those facts, or the reverse, the wife says, my husband just doesn't love me. Okay, what is he not doing or what is he doing that's telling you that? Well, when he comes home, he just plops down on the couch and we don't even talk. Okay, now we have an action. Now we have the facts. He comes home from work and he sits down and he doesn't talk to you. Let's start there. Now we can start confronting that and addressing how you feel about that. And it's not that your feelings aren't real. Your feelings are very real. But I'm telling you, especially when it comes to marriage, we need to talk facts first if you're going to get anywhere. When you start talking feelings, it's just going to get worse. We start with facts, then we'll move to feelings. Okay? Again, your feelings are important. They're real. They just might not be true. Okay? And you can tell yourself all sorts of stories from the same facts. My favorite position in conflict resolution is the objective third party. When I'm, when I'm the first or second party, it's not, as, it's not as nice. I don't enjoy that as much. But when I'm the objective third party, it's great. I can really get to the bottom of it with you. And the, what I like to do, it makes the person mad, but it makes the point and it helps them actually resolve it, is once we can get to the facts, then I start coming up with a dozen other stories from the same facts. My concern in that case is not necessarily to try to find the story that's true. We have the facts. What I want to challenge you is maybe, just maybe, you're making assumptions. And you could be offended at an assumption or a story you're telling yourself rather than what the person actually did or said. This is why you prepare for a confrontation. You don't just go in, you don't just wing it. Because then you're going to start accusing. And let me tell you, there's only one accuser of the brethren, and his name is Satan. Let's not align ourselves with the spirit of accusation, which is the spirit of Satan. Let's align ourselves with the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of comfort, compassion, and forgiveness, okay? All right, Proverbs 18, verse 13 in the New Living says this, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. How many husbands end up spouting off way before we actually hear the facts. And guess what that does? It makes you look shameful and foolish. Let's not be that, okay? 
So let's actually now jump into confrontation. Okay, so if you've prepared properly for the confrontation, how do you actually confront someone? There's so many things that can be said. Let me give you three very simple, very basic things. Confront the person's behavior, not their intentions. Or you could say their motives. The truth is, you don't know their motives. But you can confront the behavior. Because maybe you have two different assumptions about the, the intention. We think we have pure intentions, right? Because we're pure as a wind driven snow. <laughs> but that other person, they're just mean. They're just rude. They're just a jerk. Yeah, again, you're telling yourself stories. So if we're going to confront something, if you want to poke a bear, confront someone's intention and get it wrong. Assume the other party has the wrong motive and tell them. If you want to make things worse, just go ahead and do that. But if you want to get things right and reconciled, start with the behavior. You don't know the motive. You don't know the intention. Yeah? You can take the same scenarios and come up with all sorts of different intentions. My wife and I, we, we work really hard at staying a team. Okay? That's kind of really big for us is that no one, neither one of us are alone in this, in this life, especially in parenting. We are a team. And so we work together. And we make agreements that we can both work on together. And so we have a busy life, and we have four little children, seven, five, three, and one. So we, our life can be a bit messy, you know? <laughs> and the hardest time of day is between dinner time and bedtime. Because yes. in the middle is this dreaded bath time, Okay? <laughs> And all four of our kids are very dependent on us to get them through all of that. They're not old enough to be able to get themselves through any of that. So we, we made agreements that in, in a busy schedule that I have, um, that's a critical time for us to be a team. And so we made an agreement that there are certain days of the week that I get home at 5.30. It's not negotiable. I get home at 5.30. Because I'm going to be a teammate. And when I'm home at 530, I'm home. Right? I'm not just there bodily. I'm, I'm there. I'm fully present. So there would be a few times where we'd made this commitment 530. And, you know, I wrap up at the office. It doesn't take me very long to drive from the office to home. So, so I'm wrapping up. It's 515. I've got my stuff. I'm getting in the car. And I'm going to be home early. And I'm going to get a reward for it. Yeah? <laughs> Points. Because, man, I'm telling you, your points hit zero every night, okay? <laughs> Husbands, I'm just telling you, no matter how many points you get, they could be hundreds of points in one day. As soon as that alarm goes off the next morning, you're at zero, <laughs> okay? Just know that. So I'm thinking, I'm going to get points today, all right? And so I, I get a call at, like, you know, between 515 and 520, I'm thinking, this isn't that big a deal. I could knock this out. I'll still get home early. I'm good. So I'm in the car. I'm talking. And I can tell it's, it's not going to end in like five minutes. And so I'm in my driveway. It's like 527. I'm like, wrap, up, wrap, up, wrap, up. Nope, they're not wrapping up. Okay, I, I think I can still do this. I'm going to get in by 529. I'll still be early. And I'll wrap up the call just whenever I get wrapped up. So I get all my stuff. I get inside. And I'm there before 530, but I'm still on the phone. And I'm thinking... I, I kept our agreement. I'm here at 5.30. My wife did not agree. <laughs> I got the look. I don't have to show you. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? I'm home, bef I'm home before 5.30. Look at your watch. It's 5.30. <laughs> Apparently, following that agreement wasn't really the agreement. And so these are those critical moments is it that big a deal? Yeah, but really, I mean, no. But see, you start doing that every day. Those little things become huge things. And so this would have been a great moment for us to not talk about it, pretend it didn't happen, and just go to bed hoping that it'll all be okay by the next morning, which is what most husbands want to do, right? <laughs> all right, I'll just make up, I'll do dishes. I won't, we just won't say, I don't have to talk about it. I'll just make up for it by doing stuff, Right? because we don't want to be uncomfortable. So what we had to do is we actually had to talk about that. I'm upset because you're not happy that I'm home on time, which is what our agreement was. <laughs> yeah? She didn't see it that way. So obviously, 
we have different perspectives of the same thing. Yeah? So I could tell myself all sorts of stories. She could tell herself all sorts of stories. Until we actually confronted it, which is what? What are the facts? You came home, you were on the phone. Now I'll get to, to when it comes to speaking and listening, but I had to realize there was something more important than the time. It was my attention. And that it wasn't even about us, it was about our kids, that our kids love to see me come home, and when I'm on the phone, I'm thinking I'm giving them enough attention, but she doesn't think I'm giving them enough attention. So here's the deal, I get a choice, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna repent, which is wise, just so you know. <laughs> and I'm gonna change my behavior, which is, you know what? I can say if it's 535 and I'm coming in late, honey, I was on the phone, and I knew that when I come inside, I'm going to be fully inside. So I can hug on my kids and love on my kids. But little moments like that happen every day of your life. Something like that is happening every day. And we can choose to just gloss over it and pretend it's not real or just ignore it. It's not that big a deal until it becomes a big deal. And if you can learn the skill, then you can learn how to actually work together in that. And in that case, we learn something. We learn something better about each other and what we're valuing and how to actually work together in all of this. I'd like to say that every situation worked out that great. It doesn't, okay? Like, I'm a real human being. My wife is a real human being. We are real human beings, so we are not batting a thousand on this one, okay? <laughs> but there are real things that happen, and we have to learn skills to do that. So... One of those is how we actually use our words. When we're actually dealing with the real situation and not attacking people's motives, how can we actually deal with this? The first thing, Ephesians chapter five, verse, Ephesians 4, verse 15, says, instead, we speak the truth in love. In love. Speak the truth in love, growing in every way, just like Christ. Growing. You have to start seeing that the motive to confront someone is not to attack them. It's for them and or the relationship to grow, to mature. You can speak the truth in love because your motive is not to attack the person or beat them down or get one up on the relationship. It's to grow, to grow them. My wife wanted me to grow as a father. Not attack me for my misperceived priorities. It's because we wanted, we wanted something together to grow. All of our relationship have this. We have these opportunities. They might be small and they might be large. But we have these opportunities that the way we talk matters. So that's number two. Speak the truth in love. Don't just love telling the truth. God, there's a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> we are truth people. We even got scriptural backing. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. <laughs> Listen, your delivery matters to God, okay? <laughs> Delivering the truth, truth hurts. It's heavy. Can't deliver it all at one time. Yeah? In our relationships, we might love telling the truth. Why? Because we know it. We know the truth. We are right. And we like to share that. When we know we're right, man, we like everybody to know we are right. And we love telling the truth. But if you're actually going to confront someone in the name of growth, in the name of reconciliation, you can't confront them with any other motive except love. That's why you go back to confronting your own heart before you can confront someone else's behavior. Here's where you can confront your heart again. Am I speaking the truth in love? Which means I have to have the patience to speak the truth, but not all at once. Let us work towards the truth. Because I'm telling you, if you try to do it all at once and you just machine gun truth on the other party, <laughs> it, ain't gonna get, it ain't gonna get any better. <laughs> Ephesians chapter four, the last four verses of that chapter, verse 29 says, watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. This is why you need, to, you need to work out the difference between the facts and your feelings, facts and the stories, 
that you need to confront your own heart, I recommend if it's something pretty serious, it's not just every day, but pretty serious, that you get someone to, that's objective that can work with you and you almost role play. Here's what I think I'm gonna say. Here's how I wanna confront this. And the other person can go, whoa, 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 do not say that. You think that's helpful. It's not helpful. Don't say that. Because again, what's, what is at stake here? Healthy relationships. It's not just getting your opinion out. It's not just getting your words out and just let it be what it is. Say only what helps, each word a gift. Don't grieve God. We're so concerned about grieving God in so many other things than what actually grieves God. The way we talk to one another and the way we talk about one another has the highest likelihood of grieving God or pleasing him. So we should remember that. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life. Making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, and profane talk. Be gentle with one another. That doesn't mean gloss over the problem pretending it's no big deal. That doesn't mean in the name of being nice, not dealing with the real issue. It just means recognize that it's another human being on the other side of this relationship. Being sensitive does not mean being pretentious. Being sensitive does not mean that you're not actually dealing with an issue. Being sensitive means that your feelings are not the only set of feelings in this relationship. There is another human being that they have real feelings too. And we need to take account for that. That's just simply empathy and recognition of the humanity of another person. And we need to start doing that. Instead of just getting our way or getting our opinion out there or saying what we think, I'm just being real. You're really a jerk. <laughs> Be gentle with one another. Sensitive. Forgiving one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. That's what we're really after. We're after a healthy relationship that's built on Christ and his forgiveness and reconciliation. So we gotta be quick to forgive. So here's where the, now here's where the rubber meets the road. Number three, listen to understand, not to respond. So much of our conversations, especially when it comes to difficult conversations, confrontation, we want that conversation to be over so bad that we will do almost anything to get through it. Or we get so grounded in our opinion, our perspective, our way, that we just wait, we just wait for them to take a breath. And if you'll just take a breath, I can get a word in. Not just a word, my word. The word. Right? I mean, so much we're in discussion and we're like, just, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. You, you, you take a breath and I'm, I'll, I'll get you, man. We don't, we don't consciously think that way, but that's so much of what our conversations. Or we want it to be over so bad that we just, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. All, all, all right. All right. Okay. Yeah? We're not listening anymore. Or, or, or we start listening and, and you, feel, you feel that rise. Mine, the tops of my ears get red, which is so noticeable. I wish it was more hidden, like in my neck. I grew a beard so that you couldn't see if I'm getting a little upset with my neck turning red. Some people's neck turns red. You got to recognize those moments. You, you get upset, and so you're like, okay, all right, if you want to play that way, I'll play by your rules. You're about to have it. <laughs> like, how's that helpful? <laughs> So we need to learn to listen, to understand, not just to react. I had to learn skills for that. I had to learn a discipline or a skill called reflection, which is to reflect back what you think they're saying. So it's like with my wife, honey, here's what I hear you saying. Is that what you're saying? Here's how I'm understanding this. Is that true? And even try to discern the difference 
between what they're saying and your reaction to what they're saying. So, uh, but, honey, here's what I hear you saying. Now, here's what, if that's true, here's how I feel about that. But is that what you're saying? So many times, if you actually did that, be like, no, 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 that's not what I mean. Because how many of us are so eloquent that every conversation, we are masters at it, and we say exactly what we mean the way we mean it? When has that ever happened? Yeah, so many times we make dumb mistakes. We say it, and like as soon as it comes out of our mouth, we wish it were real and just grab it and stuff it back in. You need, I mean, like, especially in marriage. You say it, and then you're like, oh, crud. What did I just do? <laughs> yeah. So then we got to learn to listen. Listen, the reason why so many people feel the need to gripe and complain on every social media platform is because at the root of it, people don't feel heard. They don't feel heard. And if they actually were heard and understood, I guarantee you there'd be less public complaining. There would be less social outrage. Because people don't feel heard. And we're not patient enough to listen. That's happening every day of our lives. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2 in the God's Word translation says this, A fool does not find joy in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. Don't be a fool. Your opinion is your opinion. It obviously matters to you. Chances are, it doesn't matter that much to everybody else. So if we're going to do our part in healthy relationships, we need to listen to understand. We need to actually find joy in understanding because that does something for your relationship. Getting your opinion out there at all costs, that is not helping your relationships. Again, your opinion, you is your opinion, and it matters to you. It might matter to somebody else. But if you'll understand somebody else, your opinion will matter more to them. It's when you only are interested in getting your opinion out that you just look like an idiot, like a fool, which is the next, the next verse that I'll show you. Verse 13 of that same chapter in the God's Word translation, it says this, whoever gives an answer before li he listens is stupid and shameful. And how many times are us husbands so stupid? We're not listening. How many times, oh, honey, sh sh stop talking. Honey, I can fix your problem. Mm. You're done for the day. <laughs> your point system is in the negatives. Doesn't matter how much you've accumulated up to that point. You're now in the negatives. Prepare for the doghouse that night. That's stupid. I have one rule. Don't be stupid. That's my one rule. It saves me a lot of trouble. Don't be stupid. <laughs> listening before, like not listen, just giving an answer. Here's your problem. I can fix this for you. You look stupid and shameful. Gosh, husbands, let's stop being stupid and shameful. James, Pastor James, pastor in Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus says this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Be quick to, no, see, we are quick to speak, and we just, we all live with a low-grade fever of anger. We're just waiting for someone to flick that chip off our shoulder. And those closest to us just know exactly how to flick that chip off our shoulder. The verse after that says, anger does not work the righteousness of God. You're, 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 you're damaging your relationship with your children when you are quick to speak and quick to get angry, but slow to listen. Even your small children, they need to be heard. You will show more love and care for them by patiently listening, even to their immaturity, than you will solving all their problems. And certainly quicker than just getting angry at them. So if that's how we're going to confront people, we're going to confront their behavior, not their intention. We're going to speak the truth in love, not just love to tell the truth. And we're going to listen to understand, not just to react. Then we can see how this will build reconciliation. And so showing you what's at stake with reconciliation, if we're going to 
prepare, we're going to confront, and then we're going to reconcile. Let me show you how much this matters to God. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 in the Message Bible says this. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him or her. Forgivingly restore means that we've forgiven and we actually confronted and now we've restored, right? Saving your critical comments for yourself. Amen. <laughs> you might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. So I, try, I, I try to work an abundance of mercy for my wife because living with me takes a lot of mercy. <laughs> and so I'll just save my critical comments for myself. And I'll be merciful because at the end of the day, I'm probably going to need it. My point system is probably going to hit zero too much. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete Christ's law. The people in our relationship need us to share their burdens, not be critical of their flaws. Let's share each other's burdens rather than just pointing out all the things we can do better at? Yeah, if we're going to confront, it's because we're sharing the burden, not because we're just pointing out a flaw or a fault or a failure. If you think you're too good for that, you are badly deceived. This matters. This matters to Jesus. It matters to the church. It matters to who we are and our witness to the world. James, in James chapter 5, again, this is a pastor in Jerusalem the brother of Jesus, says this, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, which means if someone wanders from the truth, it took somebody who loves them to reach out to them courageously and lovingly and brings them back. If we can do this for people, if we can be courageous and loving Humbly confronting and reconciling, look what happens. Verse 20. You can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering, that would be you and I, bringing others back from getting off into all sorts of unhealthy behaviors, will save that person from death. Will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. See, the reason why this matters to God, and it should matter to us, is because we are an integral part of God saving people. I want you to hear me on that. Yes, at, 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 the, at the finest point of it, it is God that does the saving in the heart. But he does not just do that alone. He uses and utilizes his church, people who have his character who know how to skillfully and lovingly connect with people and know how to confront sin, not excuse it, not gloss over it, not pretend it's no big deal. No, 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 none of that. But a lot of times, instead of glossing over sin or just going ahead and letting it be what it is and celebrating sin, we jump a ditch. We jump the ditch and feel the need to share the truth and just criticize the sinner. That's what the church has become, in our nation, very skillful at. Criticizing the darkness rather than shining the light. And part of shining the light is the church. Is that you and I, as followers of Jesus, can learn how to skillfully, lovingly, and courageously confront people in their sin and bring them back. Bring them back into a loving family that does not excuse the sin but works out repentance and forgiveness. And when we do that, we save people from death. The wages of sin is death. The longer we live in sin, the more death we bring into our life. What if we could save people from that? That's why this is just, it's not just something to try harder at and hopefully do a good job at just in your marriage. No, this is something that the church should be known for. We should be famous for being able to work out hard things with people. We should be known for lovingly restoring people and caring for people. That's what we should be known for. We can save our critical comments for ourselves. Instead, we should actually know how to lovingly confront people and so bring about 
salvation, saving them from death and, and many sins in the future that they'll bring death into their life, we can be a part of saving them. We can share one another's burdens. That's our calling. That's what we're to do in Christ Jesus. Amen? Did you get anything from that today? Yeah. Father, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth, in us, and in our relationships as it is in heaven. You bring about reconciliation and forgiveness. So may we be a part of that work, bringing about forgiveness and reconciliation. We're so thankful and grateful and we're humbled that you have invited us into your work of bringing about salvation in many people's lives. We're grateful for that. We're, we're humbled by that. And so I pray, Jesus, that we keep our eyes fixed upon you because we're not able to do this on our own. We're only able to do this when we lean on your grace, when we reflect your character and your love. So transform us by your love so that we can be vessels of your love. And may we walk with the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus to bring about these, this kind of healthy relationships in this world and so shine the light of Christ into a dark and hurting world. And we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.